All right, so let's get back into the, in the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter, and we've got, you've got handouts again tonight, and uh, you're in number 10, part 10. And I know that makes Eduardo happy because I've got part numbers, and he's, yeah, it's a big thumbs up, you know, football. Um, we're in part 10, and we're continuing in life on earth in the fear and reverence of God. And tonight we're dealing with uh, 1, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. Verses 22 through 25, 1 Peter. And we're going we're gonna to kind of, you know, continue on from where we lo- left off last week. But this, in, in our handout here, we're going to go ahead and just read these, these verses right now. And then we're going to go on into this teaching and kind of follow, you know, you can continue on because we're kind of wrapping up chapter one. So starting at verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed, which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Again, Peter is reminding these churches of the things that they were taught from before when they first received the Lord and they had been discipled and taught in these things. And of course, as we know, he's, he's really doing this, this encouraging thing that, with the people under the circumstances that they're under. And we're reading here <laughs> in verse 22 where it says, since you have in obedience of the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervent, uh, fervently love one another from the heart. And I thought that was interesting that he said from the heart, because all I could think of is what is what we know in Scripture, like from Jeremiah, when when he says that the, the heart is deceitful, you know, and and, 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 and and no one can know. But but again, if you go to the top of that, he says, you know, we have this this obedience in the truth, purified, purified which has purified their souls for sincere love meaning that the Spirit of God is working in them and giving them this ability to love one another. So let's go, into the, let's go down here below, as we can see here. And we're going to talk about the fact that they have been purified here. Their souls have been purified. And in your handout it says, Now after having strengthened and encouraged the churches and reminded them of God's great grace and mercy and the assurance the ensuring hope of salvation, Peter reminds them of their responsibility to prepare themselves with what God has done in them in order to be obedient to his calling on their lives in spite of the trials and persecutions that they are, were facing continually. God has them all, I'm sorry, God has given them all that they need, they needed in order to succeed in keeping his commands. And again, this, this is always so important for us to, to understand. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I go back to our current day trials, the issues and struggles that we, we deal with in our lives today. And even if it's just talking about the mundane day-to-day things, I say mundane. I mean, you know, some of us who, who may struggle with our day-to-day lives, our issues, our finances and things that we, we things are, that are real struggles. You know, and just because of the fact that, you know, it may not be you're struggling because, you know, there's a, a, a group of marching military coming down the street to kill you any moment. You know, you, you right now, so it's the bankers that are trying to kill you <laughs> and take all your money from you, you know, the, the loan people, you know. But, but, you know, in all the things that we do in our lives, we struggle with difficulties and trials, you know. And it's always good to be able to put a, a modern day, and I say modern day, I'm not talking culturally, but I'm talking about the things that we deal with today are different than the things that people are dealing with back then. And I can't, I, I can't uh, you know, overstate that because these scriptures do have to speak to us today in our lives today. We, they have to speak to us today because of the things that we're dealing with. We've got to be able to see ourselves in our own situations in the scriptures so that we can utilize these scriptures to 
strengthen and encourage ourselves through, right? We go through these trials. We go through these tribulations, even if it's things that, that we've made mistakes on and gotten ourselves sideways, and, and then we're in a circumstance. It's not that God has walked away from, oh, well, that's your fault. You, you, you get yourself out of that because you've screwed up. But if, you're, if you love the Lord and you're walking with the Lord, life is going to throw you challenges. And this is how we grow spiritually, right? This is because we grow spiritually because we're relying on God. We're not sitting in our rooms with our head in our hands and worrying because we ourselves are unable to get ourselves out of these issues, these trials, these struggles that we're in. God is going to work these things through. Keep in mind the fact that because of the fact that you know that God has prepared you, he's given you his spirit. He's given you his spirit so that you can resist the sins that, that constantly bombard you in your daily lives, but also to be able to be obedient to the commands that he's given you so that you're effective in your life in this world, effective for him as a witness of what God has done. You are a living witness of those things because that's where people start looking at your life and looking at you and seeing that you're going through all the same things that they are. But how is it that you're surviving this without screaming and crying and complaining constantly? I work with people every day who are constantly complaining, and I'm learning to kind of try to put a more positive spin on the things because they will drag you down the hole with them if they're really good at this and a lot of people are really good at it because nothing's ever good enough, nothing's ever working right, nothing is ever. So I go into these offices and I come in kind of smiling and happy because I love what I'm doing. And I'm sitting down with the manager. Okay, what is going on? What can I help you with? And it is, oh my goodness. I was telling kid about these, these things that today that even. But it's like we Christians, because we're Christians and we're perfect, right? No. No, we are not perfect. We, we yeah. Well, what happened to us? And, 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 and please know that there are Christians in this world who believe that we should be perfect. Unfortunately, that perfection thwarts you in your, in your personal life when you think that that is true. And frankly, People like that also impose it on their brothers and sisters in the Lord, which makes them feel bad because they're not meeting your needs. You're supposed to do this. You're supp I've heard this from Christians. I've heard this from people that I know. I'm in a horrible state, and you're supposed to be the one to meet my needs is what they're saying. That's surprising, huh? I mean, I don't know if you've ever run into somebody in a situation like that, but I personally have been in that situation where I've heard people saying this i'm sitting in somebody else's house i'm sitting in with a gentleman who lives in this other person's house and he doesn't feel that his needs are being met he's a christian so he believes that all other christians should come to his aid and make sure that all of his needs are met because he's a believer and he's he's in trouble now it's not that we don't meet each other's needs and we'll talk more about that it's not that it's just that you as a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you as well. That's admonishing you when you need to be, you know, that, that conscience, you know, that, 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 that thing that's in you, that spirit that you violate because there's things that you're dealing with that you're not dealing with correctly in your life, things that you're hanging on to, things that you're doing. Well, it turns out that this individual was dealing with things that, that were out of order, out of line with God's word, frankly. And he had recognized these things. But yet, because of his circumstances that he created, made it a burden on the people that were trying to help him. They're going to work every day. They're raising their kids. They're taking care of their lives, things that God has given them. And they've offered a space in their home to, to take care of this person so that this person might do his due diligence and get back on his feet. Right? It didn't end well. And there's, a, there's too much of a story on uh, the, the rest of the story of this. But the point is, is that we've been given the things that we need as believers to be able to accomplish these things, to be able to keep his commands, the keeping of his commands, right? And if we are in the word, and not just in the word, but applying that word in our lives and remembering what we heard on Sunday or Wednesday or Friday or whatever, and in thinking about those things, when you go into the world and you start dealing with things that come against you, because things are going to come against you, then you apply those principles. First of all, trust and believe what the Lord has said. 
Now, these five churches, I'm sure what Peter had probably heard is that the, the, the people are, are they're weakening under the, the oppression that they're in. So he writes the first of these letters, 1 Peter. And he's, in writing these letters, he's reminding them of all these things, right? And, and there's, a, there's, there's points to where he's, he's greeting them and everything's wonderful and everything. And then he has to deal with the, the he has to like remind them. Then he kind of admonishes them a bit. And then he, then he starts strengthening them. And then he starts getting them to build themselves up in the word. So now we're at this point that after all of that, he is now starting to get them to start thinking about one another. Encouraging, helping one another, bearing. So let's keep reading here. Right now, at that next paragraph down. Now, at the end of this, of this chapter, Peter recognizes that that they have purified their souls by by responding in obedience to the truth. They are now able to have a deep and sincere love for one another. And let's read that verse again. It's 22, which it says there right in the handout. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Right? Okay. Peter, at this point, knows that the gospel has made such a significant impact as to purify their souls through the work of the Holy Spirit that they were able to fervently love each other from the heart, and this implies a truly deeper selfless love that bears one another's burdens. It is a command. Now, I remember a few years ago, I, um, I shared a teaching about loving one another, and it was, it, apparently it hit some it hits some, uh, some, uh, some people in the heart in certain areas, in certain places, where they were dealing with issues between their family members. See this church and the way P Peter is speaking to them as a group of family members, and they're all kind of struggling, and possibly at different levels. We don't know exactly, but they're all struggling. And what he's what he's getting them to do, and, and I, because I kind of expanded on this, as you can see, where I, where I, I, I said that it's a deeper selfless love. You think about what Jesus Christ did for us. That's, what, that's the simplest way to really put it to us, to believers, who know what Jesus did for us. And we have these images of Jesus Christ going through that persecution, that, that false trial, being falsely accused, and, and then drugged before the Sanhedrin, he was beaten and abused in that situation, and then he's sent off to all these different areas before he ends up with the, with the Roman guards, and then he's getting scourged, and he's getting beaten, and all these things that Jesus experienced. You know, every now and then it's good that somebody puts together a movie about these things, only because of the fact that, to us, sometimes we, we learn more graphically than we do just hearing about it. So if you see something acted out in film, and you've seen different levels of that and, and different levels of quality in that presentation, but what you do when you see that, you kind of remind you of the fact that Jesus went through some very horrible things in order to accomplish his father's plan for us. And I don't want you to, to disconnect yourself from the fact that Jesus Christ did this for us. Right? I want, I want us to really grab that and get a hold of that because we're, we're realizing that we're, get, we're learning a deep lesson here. Jesus did something. He, he obeyed his father. For so many people that he, he, he'd never seen everyone, right? He, he's, it's not that he had everybody in front of him that he was dying for. You know, God so loved the world that he sent his only son. He, loved, he so loved the world. And, and as Eddie has taught us about this, in general, he loved the world, you know, his creation, which is everybody that's in it. We know that not everybody is coming, but Jesus Christ made it possible for everyone if they receive him, if they put their belief and trust in him and their faith in him and that to the point to where the spirit of God is indwelling them, you know, th they come. But Jesus went through all these things and, and don't see it as, as, you know, sometimes I think that preachers put it out there as a kind of a guilt thing for people. It, it, it's, it's not that. 
what you, what you take away from that is that Jesus went through these things knowing what he was going to experience ahead of time, but knowing the, the, the end game. He, he knew the, the, the plan. And at the end of it, that he was going to rise again. And that no more will he ever go through that situation, but he accomplished the task for us to be able to achieve the things that he had, that God the Father had planned for us. So because of that, that's one of the greatest examples that we have. It's the greatest, but there's so many other examples of selfless love, right? That we can use in thinking, wow, Jesus loved us enough to go through all of that. Knowing that he was going to go through all of that, do you think that the martyrs that you, that you read in the book of martyrs, the people, the, the missionaries that's gone overseas for years and years and years, and those who have been persecuted unto death, I mean, they've left places like the United States or Europe, and they've gone over to the foreign mission field, expecting to do wonderful, great things for God, and then at a certain point, they're going to, their time is going to be done being over there, and then they're going to come back home to their, their a familiar world and you know, place, country, family. And instead, they're martyred overseas. You know, this is, you know, we don't go overseas expecting to be martyred, do we? No, we don't. But the possibility is always there. And he's the only guy I know that's ever gone up in front of a, of a witch doctor who's cut the chicken's head off, dumping the blood out all over the place like he's getting ready to pluck the thing to cook him. But no, he's not doing that. He's pouring the blood all over himself. And Eddie's like leaning in. <laughs> Eddie's like, he's, he, you know, he's, he's too through. You know, right? So this, this, I, I've been there, done it too many times. I, I'm too through with you, okay? But you know what, what Eddie does is he puts into, into practice the fact that he knows who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus did for him and the fact that the Spirit of God is in him and he's mature in that knowledge and he knows that if he acts in obedience, God is with him and working with him. And that's going to deal with that witch doctor. That witch doctor hasn't got nothing going on because when the chips are down, whatever strength he had, it, it, all of it turns out to be just the makeup that he's wearing, a dead chicken in his hand that can't help him. <laughs> and he's covered in blood, and then his buddies around him are mad at him because he's backing up. So you see, it's not like every devil's going to back up from you, you know, but the point really is, is that when God places you in a situation that you need to be, you need to be effective then. And this is what, this is what Peter is dealing with here, is that there's work to be done by these churches, by the, the individuals, the people, these groups of people who are in these churches, right? So when God places you in that situation, he's already given you what you need. Now, that may sound unfair. If, that, if we were speaking to a bunch of people in the world, they're going, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. They're put in a situation where they're at a disadvantage. There's not an even playing field. Well, where's my encouragement bell? <laughs> that's where God wants you. Is at a place of a disadvantage so that he can work through your weakness. You know, it's like you, <laughs> it, 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 it jumps out of the pages when you start realizing what's going on. You know, should Peter be saying, oh, you poor people, do what you can, run, hide, go, you know, head to the... No! He's telling them to guard up the loins of your mind. He's like, first, get your mind right, get your head straight, right? Remember what you've been taught. Remember that you've been filled with the Spirit of God and you've been given the power to accomplish His will. And He's not putting anything on you that you can't accomplish because He knows you. He created you. He's given you all that you need, so you need to move forward. So you need to, here's what you need to do. And He's given these step-by-step -step things. And now after giving Him all of that instruction, now... You're, you're built up now. You're armed the way you need to be. You've got your, you've got your armor on. Your mind is right. You're prepared. You're now at a point to where you need to start looking after each other now. Looking after each other's needs. Helping one another. Building and strengthening each other up so that you can walk arm in arm. March arm in arm. Spiritually, I'm saying here, right? Because, you know, they're not going with weapons in their hands. They're going the weapon of, 
of prayer. Prayer. That's really all they have because they're under persecution from people who have the ability to wipe them out at will. You know, we don't understand all, what that really all means here, but we, we know enough to know that they don't know when the day's going to come. You know, I, I keep thinking about our brothers and sisters in the Middle East who are like, they're familiar with death. They're familiar with losing people that they know for whatever reason, different reasons. People are killed just because of their Christianity, just because they may have done something that offends this other group of people. And then next thing you know that they're dead. And then the families find out about this. They've lost another family member, another uncle, another brother, another brother or sister in the Lord. You see what I mean? They're very accustomed to losing people. But one of the things that they have taught me is that when that type of loss becomes familiar because it happens so often around you in your community, in your neighborhood, you really have nothing to do but rely on God because he has promises that he's made. You know, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I'll never forget what you said, Norman, about those guys, those, those, those Muslim gentlemen in, in Santa Monica that came up trying to proselytize you on the street. You know, I don't know if they thought they were Jehovah's Witnesses or something. They can give to you. No, they, they're trying, to, they're trying to, to, to bring you into their group, right? But I remember you said something that never left me, and you said, do you have an assurance of your salvation? Do you have an assurance? Right? And I thought about that, and I said, well, listen to that. That's a simple question. And guess what? They have an answer for that. But they don't want to tell you that answer because you already know that you have an assurance of salvation from the God that you love and that you serve, right? We have an assurance. And this is the thing that draws, and it, I think I shared it last week where the churches in Russia don't have nominal Christians because being a Christian will cost them something. So if somebody comes to Christ in their churches, these people are coming to salvation for real because they know it's going to cost them a lot. It's going to cost them their lives. And we know the same thing happens in other places around the world. You see, here in America, this is where we have the big problem. And one of the biggest problems is, is dealing with these new churches that are coming out, these emergent churches where the gospel is being watered down. And I mentioned this before, too. When you, when you start chipping away at the basic principles of the gospel, the basic tenets of faith, of, of salvation, you start chipping away to make it easier for people to come in. Many, you, you, you don't remind them of the fact that there's a consequence for rejecting Jesus Christ, right? Because people don't want to tell others that they're going to go to hell, Right? People don't want to hear that. You'll run them away. They'll leave the church. They'll, they'll cancel their membership. <gasps> if you tell them that, that they could go to hell if they reject Jesus Christ, you know, but a lot of people, they come in the church, they sit there in the pews, and they already become members, you know, and they, nobody ever told them that they had to do all this. I'm a Christian. I show up at church every Sunday. I got a Bible. It's a little dusty on the week, during the week, but I have it on Sunday. I go to all the functions. I go to all the camps. All the, the banquets, you know, where I'm here, I'm there. What more must I do to be saved? Okay, rich young ruler, let me tell you what you need to be. You see what I mean? You tell them the truth, and all of a sudden, they start doing the moonwalk. <laughs> but you see, we can't do that. We can't allow ourselves to, to fall backwards that way. I know what those churches are doing. We, we get it. What they're trying to do is they're trying to fill the pews and with, with warm and fuzzy messages. It seemed like years and years ago, people would, would preach hellfire and brimstone messages, and people would come flowing to the front in repentance. Now, I don't know if that's only in the movies or just stuff that you're reading, but, but it seems that there was a, po a time when people were, were, visibly, were more willing to be visibly uh, 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 repentant 
recognizing their sin after hearing the gospel, responding to the gospel, and then turning their lives around. Their lives are turned around by God doing the work in them, right? But we have harder, hardened hearts in this day and age. In America, we have hardened hearts. We know this. We know this is the case in America because we live here. We know. And whenever there's a preacher who's willing to speak the truth in the community, he's, he's called mean-spirited. I remember a preacher in Oakland, California. I'm going to bring Oakland up again because it's, it's in the Bible. They just call it Nazareth in the Bible. <laughs> I think that's what I mean. I have to look at the Greek in that and make sure. But, but there was a preacher in Oakland years ago. I've been watching the decline of the Bay Area for many years. Very prosperous, wonderful place. You know, my dad bought our house on the peninsula for $25,000, I think it was, it cost. Yeah. And um, it's now worth $2.3 million, I think we, I looked online. $2.3 million. Same little house, same little footprint, same neighborhood. All the trees are huge now, and they were twigs when I was a kid. Yeah, <laughs> right. But it's been on this decline because it's spiritually dark. I'm just going to tell you the truth because I know. It's, it's become very progressively spiritually dark it's prospered you know in my t hometown big names in the tech world have houses you know in menlo park and palo alto and stanford you know where, where the university is around there it's all beautiful built brand new home big big homes and these but it's spiritually dark people have everything they want everything they need there's trails to ride your bike in the hills and they've chased all the rattlesnakes out of there amen but in Oakland, in all those cities on the, on, on the East Bay, it's evil. I, the, the kids didn't start spinning out in the, in, the, in the neighborhoods in their cars until kids started doing it in Oakland, just out on the, on the freeway, just outside of Oakland, right? Where you can look over and see into downtown Oakland, and there they are, 5 o'clock, rush hour. Cars block the freeway off. Kids in, in 5.0 Mustangs, the old ones, you know, and they're spinning out, doing donuts in the middle. Their girlfriends are sitting on the hoods of the other cars that are blocking the traffic. People are trying to get home, and they're doing donuts, spinning out. Never saw this thing before. This is several years ago. The city, it, it, the crime starts in the police department. You could read about this. I'm not lying about this, and there's a lot of people that are upset about it there. In the flats where the city is, CHP used to go down there and help patrol. And a few years ago, they said, we're done. We're not doing it anymore. The city's gone to trash, and the, the local police department has not been doing their gig. And you can read about that. I'm, what I'm telling you is public information, and they have a local newspaper, that uh, online paper that I, I get. I, I actually get it, and I read what's going on in that area. But they let everything happen there. They glorify all the evil and the sin. They glorify it like it's a wonderful thing. You know, they, they you know, and they, you wonder, you know, people say, well, why did God allow this to happen? Well, well, you kicked him out first. But you see what's happening there, and then there are still churches there. Thank the Lord there's still churches there and pastors that will speak. And guess what? The city was desperate, so they went to the to the you know, faith-based organizations for help. So a pastor was, was working with a bunch of young kids because kids are left to, 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 to let the, the streets raise them. You think L.A. is, L.A., yeah, it has its reputation because of Compton and the South Central and all that. Yes, yeah, South Central. Um, but people don't, they don't realize what's sitting there in Oakland and in, in, in the East Bay there and all those cities are out around there. They don't know. I got family that grew up there and out there. Some of my family is part of all that, so I can tell you, I know what I'm talking about. But pastor said, we don't have a police problem here. At least that's when, back in when he, it wasn't a police problem. He said, we have a black problem. Now, this is a black inner city pastor from a local church in the flats in Oakland. The flats is where 
it's the flat area of Oakland where you can see that you can see the ocean if you look close enough and, if, and, you, and the train runs right through the middle of town and in one part of the town there's a shopping there there's malls and gross and, and, and stores and stuff and the other part is, is the hood and there's even hills where rich folks live but the problem they were having with, with was with young black teenagers and he was working on that situation specifically but he couldn't get help from the families from the parents from the relatives couldn't get help from the community and see later on we find, we started finding out that the police department was involved in a massive sin and i'm just going to use that term because that's what it is getting involved with local prostitutes and if you've never driven through in oakland at night on the on the outskirts you go to to this um a and pm stores they have at the gas station i remember i was there doing some ministry up in oakland hills at a church in the evening we went down to get gas in the car so we can drive off and we can leave off the high on the highway first thing in the morning. <sighs> the gas station was surrounded by prostitutes. In a way that you never see here in Los Angeles. I'm telling what I'm telling is that it became a stronghold for the enemy. Okay? So the local pastors that were trying to help affect positive change in the community were not able to do what they were attempting to do and they were getting frustrated because they realized that they weren't getting help from from the authorities from the police let alone the families it's, that town's been like that for a long long time you have to call sin what it is and you have to point it out and you're not going to be making friends and you have to tell people sometimes some, some things that aren't warm and fuzzy. But that's, that's our job. That's our job, Christians. So we have to start, you know, we have to start at home. For us, let's, let's just make it real for us here. We got to start at home. We got to love one another. We got to love one another. Let's just start right in our own little church here and take it to our houses. Let us love one another. Let's look at some, some scripture in here. Let's go look at Romans See what Romans chapter 12 says. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 10. Verses 9 and 10, Romans chapter 12 in the handout there, right in the handout. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Brotherly love. Be devoted. Devoted to one another. We really have to really look at ourselves. Let's just, like I said, let's just start within our own homes and in our church family. Are we devoted to one another? Are we, are we willing to go to the wall with one another? Are we willing to stand there and bear one another's burdens? Are we willing to really strengthen one another, strengthen each other, come alongside a brother or a sister so that they can kind of get through the things that they're struggling with? Or it's all in common. We're all struggling at the same time. But let's work together and struggle through this. We'll get together. We will pray together. Right? We will, we'll just talk. We'll sit down over coffee and talk. Have time to talk, you know. We were in Los Angeles. We're, so, we're all busy people. We're all so busy. Everybody's busy. From the little babies, they're busy. To all the grown folks, of course, we're all busy. We can't talk to each other. We text one another, and that's okay. I get it. I get it. But we never look forward to spending FaceTime with one another. And I'm not talking about the app. All right, see? You're going to say that, well, I'm going to obey pastor. I'm going to use FaceTime. <laughs> He said it. But are we devoted to one another? Look at John, book of John, chapter 13, verse 4. I'm sorry, 34. John, chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give to you. A new commandment. Look at that. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Wow. Boy, who's saying that? Mm-hmm, right? So we can't, we, that, you know, we're getting a command that we must love one another. Jesus is telling us, love one another. 
Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Be devoted. Oh, there it is again. Oh, do I have to? Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. So we can give preference, right? We can be a respecter of persons, love one another in that regard. <laughs> give preference, meaning, you know, this. there is a world out there that is hungry. And, and this is important. I want to bring this up just so that we all understand. If you, if you read the scriptures carefully, charity starts at home. Yes, we give to the homeless that are outside of our door, right? We go, we do downtown, you know, and, and we see all the people that are, that are in camp, encampments along the freeway, the highways and byways. That scripture kind of comes to life when you see all the people that live on the highways and byways of our town. But yes, we give to them because we see the need, and we see need, but we also are willing to share the gospel with them, amen? All right, they need the gospel as well. You know, remember the poor. But you see, the poor, it, is, it happens in the church as well. We need to start there first. We need to make sure that each other, we're not, that, that the, those of us here in the church, there isn't one that's left out, that's pushed aside, who's in need. That means that we have to know what's going on with one another. That means we have to talk and communicate with one another. That's love. If you sit down with somebody and just let them speak to you for a moment, and, and the way the scriptures say, in honesty, right, with, a, with, a, with a, a pure heart, a sincere heart, right, and listen in, in, in concern for your brother and sister, and remember them in your time of prayer and pray for them. If you don't pray right there at that moment when you're, when you're talking, you know, that's the kind of attitude that we should have with one another, you know. P Peter, you know, I'm sure Peter's having to remind the, the, those folks the same thing because they're all dealing with some really difficult situations in their lives. And how are they, they going to do all of that? Well, there's a way, of course. Of course there is. But just for us and for our understanding, we need to be able to, to love one another and really love one another to the point of being willing to come alongside that person and even undergird that person if need be. And you know, when, you know when you're being abused. You know when there's times when you need to tell somebody you, you need to kind of manage your situation, right? You need to recognize. Because, see, that's the other part of love, right? That's that tough love. Now, some of us love to give tough love because that means that you get to beat up on them and just work them a little bit, right? But, you know, when you're, it's just like when you're disciplining your little children. You, you do that because you love them, because you want to lead them in the right direction, you want to add a little pain to that disobedience and so that it doesn't seem so attractive anymore to do, even though they will try you and try you. I was watching a video of a little kid who was sitting, in the, mommy had the camera on the kid because she knew exactly what the kid was going to do, sitting in the high chair, and there's like a bowl of some food sitting there, and the kid's looking at, at the bowl and puts his hand on the bowl, and mom knows because he's done it before and says, don't dump that bowl. Do not dump that bowl. And he's looking at mommy. And slowly the bowl is moving. Don't dump that bowl. Slowly the bowl is moving towards the edge of the... I'm telling you, don't dump that bowl. And the kid has this look on his face like, Oh, dear mommy, I understand your heart, but I must do this thing. <laughs> now that was my little addition to the, the story because <laughs> this little kid wasn't able to speak to me. He's a little kid. He's not even... But you see how you see how that works. You know, it's just there. There are great things that are lessons for us all. Let's keep reading here. A Christ-like love. A Christ-like love is a selfless love that puts others' needs above your own. If we are called to go the extra mile for our enemies, as in. Matthew 5, 41, and maybe we'll read that. Just, just remember, what, you'd like to remember what that is. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. We must certainly go the extra two miles for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you know what? I'm going to go right there. I'm going to go to that because this is going to, this is going to offend some, some people here. You're going to be offended. Matthew chapter 5, verse 41. <laughs> you're going to be offended. Why? I'm going to do that. What? Now, you remember the zealots, right, in, uh, 
in the time of Christ. They couldn't stand those Romans. They abused them and they treated them bad and everything. They couldn't stand them. All, the last thing they wanted to do is go an extra mile for those guys. But chapter 5, verse 41 says, whoever forces you, and, and, and that's what the, the story really is, and, 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 and there was a teaching about it many years ago that I, I did not forget as a baby Christian. I heard this story where the Romans would do marches. They have to march to, from place to place. They didn't all ride on horseback. They marched. They walked. And they probably had some officers that were on horses, but they marched, and they had heavy stuff to carry with them. They had these big shields, and they had their provisions that they had to carry with themselves. So because of all this heavy gear they had, they would have to carry this and march, and they, they had to keep up. You know, you don't, you don't lag back and go, hey, guys, stop wait. You know, look, I got two daughters that went into the Army, and believe me, there was no, wait, guys, wait for me. As a matter of fact, my youngest daughter, poor, poor Jan, they put her, they liked her so much, they put her in the front because, you know, the ones that they like, you know, they put them in the front of the group because they want them up at the front to encourage everybody else. So Jana, the one that hated to, to run, she didn't like to run at all, although by the time she got out, she didn't mind running a whole lot anymore. She just did it. But you have to keep moving. It's heavy stuff. You get tired. Roman soldiers get tired. So if you're on the side of the road watching these guys, and you're just an average Joe person, Jewish person, whatever, and they're marching through town, and you're standing there going, hmm, that's interesting. One of those guys is going to come over to you and say, you, come here. Carry this shield for me. You talking to me? No entiendo, no entiendo. No company. No, you understand what I mean, because I'm going to speak to you in Aramaic and Roman and all these. <laughs> yeah, right. See? So what would happen is that they would grab somebody and say, carry this for me. And you would walk with them and you go a mile. But as a believer, you're being taught here. You, what does it say? Maybe, maybe let me get my fix my glasses or something here. I don't know. I could be reading this wrong, but it says. It says, whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. May as well read 42. Give him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Uh-oh. I had to keep going. So that sewing machine that you borrowed, uh, or that, 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 that lawnmower, or that hedge trimmer, or sport coat, you, you guys, or that skillet you borrowed from the neighbor, because you, know, you needed uh, a real cast iron one. She, she had a great, really good one. Yeah. <laughs> no, ladies and gentlemen, we are called to, to go above and beyond as believers, we're not, we, we can't use the excuse. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I touched a nerve. No, 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 look, we, we struggle with, with even sharing our own, own stuff amongst one another. That's a difficult thing. You see, when you invest a lot in your own stuff, stuff, you value that stuff, and you don't want to give it away. You don't want to share it. You know, this is a real serious lesson for all of us in America and the West who have the ability to accumulate stuff. That's what we're here for. That's why we succeed in our jobs, so we can gain wealth and buy stuff. Buy stuff. I mean, George Carlin, you know, he would talk about stuff. You build an extra room on your house so you can put in more stuff, more of your stuff. But you see, your stuff ends up defiling you because you take your stuff and you turn it into little worship idols. You know? And then you don't want to part from it. You don't, you don't want to part from it. Now, I do remember, I have to look back. I'm going to be honest with myself. And, and I, there, I did get a point, to a point in my own personal life, particularly after I, I became a Christian and I was a young believer and still learning this thing, Christianity, and still, you know, going to Bible studies and, and 
learning every time something new. I'm like, wow, wow, I'm, I'm messing up on this and that and this and that. And I remember getting to a point in my, my own self that I was sick of myself. I was sick of how I had been in my past. I didn't like it. And I knew that there were still some pieces hanging on of that. And I remember that. Situations where I wouldn't share. Even when I was a kid, I thought back at things when I was a kid where you know, I did something that I got advantage of over some of the kids because I, I got something, but I, I, I should have shared it, and I didn't. You know, and there's probably more to that, but I'm, I'm just saying, you know, there's times when I, I realized, and, and when, when you become a, a new believer, you start remembering of the things that you used to do, the person that you used to be, and that's why it's so amazing when the Spirit of God starts working you, and when, when Christ says that he, he, he starts working you, that he completes and he continues it. And as we get to be mature Christians, we realize he's still working on us, Right? So those kind of things really kind of made an impact on me, and I couldn't stand how I knew I was. I really thought about it. I remember I was, something happened at work, and I, and I just, I, had to pull, I think I pulled over in my truck, and I was just, I'm sick of myself. I am sick of myself. And I, I made an effort. I, I was actually on my way home from the Valley Kid. I was, we were living in an apartment in Hollywood, and... Uh, and I was, I, I needed to be something different. You know, I'm, I have a child at the time. I think we only had one. I have my wife, you know, that works for an, a thankless place downtown, you know, and I can't be that way. I can't be selfish. I cannot be, you know, you know I, I can't, you know, because I worked hard all day, this is mine. This is only mine. Or because I worked so hard, very long that I saved up and I got this thing, it's just mine, it's mine. So you know what, that, and, and I think this is valuable, and this is something that may help us as Christians everywhere, because I'd like to help everybody. Um, the things that I needed for tools, there's certain things that you don't skimp on because you need them. So my dad always says, buy these brand of tools. Client, you know, electrician, you buy a certain brand of tools. And if, you, if you're an electrician, you show up on a job and you don't have that right, that same brand of tool, they're going to go, dude, what's the matter with you? What is that? Made in where? Because our stuff is made in America. Uh, but, but, you know, the one that's made offshore works just as good. Doesn't cost as much. It may not even last as long. You never know. But maybe it will. But I stopped valuing that brand name and the money that is attached to it because it causes you to invest Instead of, and it's because that's a different term, when instead of buying something, you're investing in something. You're investing in something. Now, there's, there's times when you need to, to spend the money to get something, the, the right stuff, okay? That's valid. So I'm not wiping that out. I'm just saying that there's times when you need to just go, wait a minute, I could do this with that. But what it does is that you buy something that you'll still use and accomplish the job. It doesn't cost as much. But here's the kicker. If somebody says, you know, I need one of those, and you're going to look at yours and you say, oh, I got one of those. Here, take, take mine. Did I say that? <laughs> yeah, but I want that thing back if I, you know. <laughs> or somebody says, you know, I need 10 bucks. Oh, I have one of those. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's different. That may be different. But but here here here's here's really the analogy that I'm trying to draw is that like it's it it even works with, you know. I I, I have a lot of tools that are not made by a certain big manufacturer called Klein, and I still use them for electrical work, and they do the job. I've used them here in the church for years. I've used them at home and at work. And they still do the job. And if I had to give it to somebody and just, just give it to them, I know I can go to another store. I'm not going to advertise for them now, so then, but I know I could get another one that's less expensive. One of the same tool costs about $45, for probably 50 now. It's just a pair of pliers, a certain. But you can get one that costs $2, and it does the same job. And you can release that easier. 
It's not like you're trying to give somebody the worst, the, you know, you know, you're trying to give people junk. You're giving something, somebody something that you would use yourself, but you're willing to let it go because you're not so attached to it because of that investment of $40, $50. It makes you think about your stuff a little differently. I'm going to make it even more personal. You all know my guitar player. And, and I, have, I have several. And I have several of them because I use them for different sounds and different things. Somebody came over to my house one time and was a little upset at me because they saw three guitar cases leaning in the corner along with my amp and my bag that I have my wires and my junk. And he looked at me and he says, why do you have all those? You don't need all those guitars. Why do you have that? I'm like, this dude's in my house. Ain't telling me. Dude's in my house. Get ready to eat my food. Watch my TV. What does that sound like? But I, I didn't do that. I, I, I could have, I what do they call that? There, there, there's words for that in the vernacular that we don't need to share here. Because we're not from the hood here. But, but no, you know what? He's like, I have, a bunch, I have different guitars for different sounds. And... In those days, I did, you know, and, and from time to time, I, well, of course, because I still, I still play, and I, do a lot of, I still do a lot of music ministry stuff out and about. We don't do it here now anymore, but in other places, I do. Um, and I do use them. I record with them, and I make music for the church. If you listen to our videos, you know, Eddie's videos, when you're, when you're hearing him teach and everything, though, that music uh, is, is music I've composed on, on my computer and my guitars and my inst other instruments and the piano that I'm not that good at, but I can, I can fake it. But the thing is, I use those things. God gave me that skill. I used to make it a living at doing it. When I was making a living, my main one cost about, now this is back in the 80s. That thing cost about seven or 800 bucks. I had this thing called a Les Paul, okay? Big name, expensive, but as a pro. I work, this is my job. I have a Les Paul because that's what I needed for my job. I traded for another guitar and I needed a pro because I traveled with that thing, you know. And it has a few others too as well for different things. But lately, you know, I've, you know it's just like anything. You trade cars in, you, you trade stuff in, you, you, you get different stuff, you know. But now that I'm not a touring professional or anything like that or, or working, traveling kind of, I don't need to spend now because that same guitar costs like, Four thousand dollars now, or maybe even more. So, so here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. What I have been doing for many years, and Kit can attest to this. Um, my guitars cost no more than they'll cost less than two hundred bucks. Less than two hundred. But what I do is I take them, and I work on them, and I tool them, and I fix them, and I change things, and I make them do what they need to do to where it sounds and works just like the two $3,000 model. But if somebody needs one of those guitars, I'm not gonna go, that's my investment, because that's what it is. People buy these things, they hang them, they put them in vaults so that they can grow in value and they can say, I have one of those. There are people that own those ones that say Les Paul on the top that cost a half a million dollars. I know you know, you know somebody who has one of them. He says, no, but don't touch that one. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? As Christians, we get caught in this trap. My daughter's bought me a guitar. It cost, it didn't even cost a hundred dollars. It cost ninety-nine nine nine. <laughs> How much don't ask? They had to get me a guitar for Christmas. What do you want, Dad? I said, Well, I need one of these. I don't have one of these. That's just a plain one of these. So they got me one. It looks just like the one that cost. Yeah, $2,500 from Corona, right out in Corona in, in California. This one costs $99.99. I ripped all the cheap electronics and hardware off of it. Had a bunch of good stuff in my room. Solder away, screws, bing, 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 bing. Worked on it, and then now it's a pro working instrument for $99.99. Now, I have friends that would get mad at me because you need to be playing this, this, and this, because that's, no. 
Because the people here, they're not going to know if it costs $5 or $25 or $150. They don't know. It's in your hands. But if somebody says, you know, dude, I need a guitar, I could actually, you know what? Here you go. It's not like it's going to be like super easy because, you know, you put all that effort into making this $99, do all this thing. But the point is, is that it's not an investment anymore. And this is where God had changed my heart in, in that kind of thing. Because what he did is that he allowed me to see these things as tools to use for a particular purpose. Not as idols. Not as idols. And this is what it is. Your grill can become an idol because you don't want to give it up. It's, it's funny when you say something like that, but you think about the things that are in your closet. Think of the things that's in your shed for a moment and think, wow, I didn't know I felt that way about that stuff. What I feel, it, it, it really, you know, one day I was watching the news, and it was years ago, because we've had recently a lot of disasters, but years ago there was, a, there was a, another fire up in Malibu, and there was a family that was on the news, and they were talking about their house that burnt everything gone. Memorabilia, you know, you, you know the story. Everything, they lost everything. Well, they had insurance and everything. Well, this is an older couple. They were probably in their, like, 50s. And I remember seeing them on the, on the news talking about the things that they lost. And here's what the guy said. And I don't think this guy was a Christian because he didn't really, that, it's not what I got from what he was saying and his, his, his words and his actions. But what he said was this, and he's with his wife right there. So they've talked about this. And they said, this is actually going to allow us to start over afresh, to start over again. I would have never expected somebody to say that. We had a house in Malibu in the hills that you could see the ocean from. They probably raised their family there, their kids. They're an older couple. They're, you know, they're close to retirement age. What are they going to do? They didn't seem to be so concerned about that. So maybe they'd done something on, uh, beforehand to make sure that if something like that happened, they would be covered. But, he, but what he said still stuck because you still have to recover from something like that right but this man says that this gives us an opportunity to start all over again he lost all these papers and things he was talking about things that they'd lost records and they start all over again would we have that same attitude as a, as a, as a believer as a christian you know what if you really need the stuff that you had God would bring it back to you because he supplies all of our what? All of our needs, right? He supplies these things. Why don't we? You see, you got you to gotta remind yourself of those little baby scriptures that you remember when you were told when you were a kid, you know, the baby Christian, is that God supplies all of our needs, right? We tell the churches overseas the same thing, you know, when they're calling us every other week and saying, uh, God told me to tell you that you're going to give us $100. And we, and we say, well, yes, God will provide. <laughs> it's, there, there's, there's lessons in this world to learn from. You know, if a donkey can speak to a man, an unbeliever on a, a, in Malibu can probably tell us something that, we, that would surprise us. But I took a lot away from that. I'm thinking, wow, start over again. That means starting over again, you got to get a new license. You got to go get new this and that, all the things that you need to live. But you know what? When a person that you walk up to on the street who is homeless, has nothing but the stuff in his cart or what's on his back, life is good. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. They release themselves from a lot of responsibility that is a, wor as a world thing, Right? World responsibility. Now, there's, there's an irresponsible aspect of this, so I'm not ignoring that, because if you talk to enough people, you understand why they're out there, why they don't want to have a license anymore, why they don't want to get back into the workforce anymore. They're, doing a, they're living a pretty good life, but there are those that are out there who don't want to get back into their old rat race anymore. And you'd be surprised at how many of them came from a rat race. You know, they're, they're, everybody remembers that story of the guy in an L.A. mission who uh, we used to be um, an engineer who worked on the first space shuttle program. And he went through the, the program, the Christian program in the L.A. mission and came out and, and rebuilt his life and everything is, is back on track for him. But 
he got to a point to where he could not take care of himself and his family anymore. And he ended up in the L.A. mission. You know, it can happen to anybody. When you lose a lot of stuff, you all of a sudden start realizing what is important in life. What's important in your family, you know. And if you're a Christian, you really are. You, you don't go anywhere without God. God is walking through that flame with you, right? Always. But the things that he's giving you, your family, you know, your, your, your wife and kids, you know, your, you know, your mind, the things that you're able to do, your, that he's taught you and allowed you to be able to do, you still have things. You know, you're not left with nothing. It's, it's, some, it's some difficult things that we have to really face as, as believers, especially when we're seeing situations like this that we read here in Scripture and stories that we see from around the world where people are under massive persecution. Christians, believers who are just like us, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are losing everything, losing family members, losing church buildings, homes being burnt down, things like that, that we don't, see, we don't experience that kind of thing on a regular basis because there are Christians here. But we have to really assess our own lives so that we're able to truly say that we're keeping his command. And when Jesus says, you know, I give you a new command, love one another more than your stuff, you know, more than your time. That's, that's, this is tough stuff for us to really get a hold of because every now and then we're confronted with the truth of that and we're like, wow. Be encouraged at the fact that God uses those things in our lives to kind of prick us a bit so it wakes us up. It's like getting a pinch to wake up to the truth of something. Because we're supposed to be growing as Christians. We're supposed to be growing in the knowledge of the Lord and the things that he's teaching us. We've got to grow in these things so that we can mature ourselves. Because yes, it's not so that we can have a prosperous life of money, plenty of food, a new car every year, beautiful homes, things to show off to your neighbors and computing, compete against your neighbors with. No, so that, it's so that we can be prepared. That's why he doesn't give us all the things that we want. He supplies our needs, because if we got all the things that we want, we'd be on vacation all the time. <sighs> A Christ-like love. Philippians. Chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, starting right at the beginning of verse 1. And we'll read to verse 8. Therefore, if there, I'm sorry, yeah, therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from self selfishness or empty conceit. Uh oh, it's dinging us here. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Ouch! That's, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Verse 4. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests. Oh, stop. You can stop now, Lord. You can stop right there. And that's... But no, he's going to go on because he's, he, to finish this sentence, he said, but also... For the interests of others. Oh, did he have to say that? Did Paul have to say that? Yes. Have this attitude in yourselves, which, also, which was also in Christ Jesus. Right? Remember I said that? All that he did. He laid down his life. Verse 6. Who, although he existed in in the form of God, did not regard equal equality with God a thing to be grasped. And that's heavy right there. That is huge because that, what he did is that he, 
he lowered himself to where he was walking on the same dirt that you and I walk on. In this world, was confronted by the same sin. That's why he had compassion for us, because he could he he had that flesh on him too, right? But he didn't sin. But he knew what we were dealing with. And and, and let's let's let us know. Because this is saying something really, really heavy here. All, who, although he existed in the form of God, Emmanuel, God with us, right? That's heavy, man. How else can you say that? But did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped because he had something that he needed to accomplish in that form. And he did it. Verse 7. But emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant. We know what that word really is there, right? It's right. It's doulos, right? That term, that, that, that word, that, that means slave. And being made in the likeness of men. There, there's more. We're going to go more into that, that aspect of things on Sunday as well. Being found, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, oh my goodness, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wow, I'm, I'm blown away by just reading that, and I've read this, over, you know I've read this a whole bunch of times, but I'm still blown away every time I read that, because this is what we were just talking about. Christ did all that he did to the point to, of death. So when Peter is talking to these churches, these five churches, he knows that they're going to their death. But they have to continue on. They have to accomplish the task that was set before them, that they are called to. They have to keep his commands. They have to look after one another. They have to make sure that they're prepared in season and out of season. Even under that stress Oh, I can't take my job. It's stressing me out so bad. Is it five o'clock? I need, I need happy hour. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we need happy hour, right? Go home, turn on the TV, and watch the cartoons. That's happy hour. But you see. We are confronted. <laughs> we are confronted, right? Oh, let's keep going. Let us keep going. But d d does any of this make sense? I, I, I hope it does. Oh, I hope it does because I'm really, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I have to, go, you know, it, it's, it's really something when you have to study these things so that you can present a message on it. You're really, you, you know, you, you get the full brunt of it. You get the full brunt of it. You know, the dictionary definition gives you all those different definitions. Yeah, yeah. To, to have, you know, to, yeah, and I can't remember all the different descriptions because there's a whole bunch. I mean, you do those word studies, you get a whole bunch. Now, it's, it's probably better to go into the Greek to see what, the, what, if there was a different version of that. And I did not do that on that particular word. Oh, yeah, other versions, yeah. Right, and it's in it, right in verse ten, in verse ten, and be devoted. Right, so you know what? It's the the difference in translations, and that's you know sometimes I'll do that. I'll be using the Amplified because it speaks a lot plainly on this on a particular thing. 
you know, it, every, I, I think what we can get, definitely looking at the other versions of that, and this is something that, that, that I do as well, because thank God I have, you know, that app that gives you the crop reference and all the different versions. We can use that word, understanding, first of all, context in regards to what is being said and who is it being, it's being said to so that you don't take it to the point of using that devotion as if you're devoting yourself to God or something like that, putting that type of devotion to words yeah yeah that's that that'll be a good a good homework because you know you don't want to you, you don't want to raise these the, these people up to the level of your devotion to the word of god god you know you know and, and that kind of thing you don't want to take it to that point where you're you know but it's it's clear in different versions of it where it's just saying that you need to be devoted in, in so far as looking after and devoted to the, the to that work of being loving towards your your brothers and sisters so that you're you're keeping that command which is clear in so many other passages, you know. So, yeah, no, no, it's 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 always good to yeah, to delve into that kind of thing. It is. And we're talking again the disciples' relationship between one and uh, between each other. Jesus instructs his disciples just before he is to be arrested and falsely accused. This is in that next par page, par paragraph. And I don't know if your your handouts or pages the same as they are. Okay. Right, where he's, he's being arrested, falsely accused. He commands them to love each other as he loved them. And that's wonderful, you know. I mean, the, 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 you know, the thing that he says at that very moment, he's talking about them teaching them. He's still teaching them, right? Still teaching them, at, even at that point. And let's look at another verse here. John, no oh boy, I'm running out of time here. John chapter 13. 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, and you also love one another. 35 says, By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And let's hope, ladies and gentlemen, that as we are believers, that people were able to see that. That is evident in our own lives, right? John chapter 15 we are running out of time as usual here. 15 verses 12 through 18. This is my commandment, he says again here. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life. We just talked about that, right? Lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, don't take that term friend of Jesus too lightly because there's a lot of people that misuse that. And that, that, that starts to be irreverent at a certain point. You know, you have to be willing to, to, to walk a walk that you haven't really gotten to. That's just like Peter saying, yes, I will go with you to the wall. And then he's on the side crying about having not made that, <laughs> met that challenge, right? So you don't, want to, you don't want to go too far there. Verse 15, no longer do you, I call you slaves. And I think it's neat that that word slaves is put in there, not servants, right? No longer do I call you slaves, for the slaves do not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So we have that benefit as well. You do not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And that fruit, I'm sorry, and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Woe down, slow down there. Make sure you understand what he's saying about this. So that we, and this is a benefit for everybody who may hear this. Don't take this out of context. I, you know, we, are, we in this room know what we're talking about here. But he says, you know, ask of the Father in my name. He may give to you. Ask whatever. That's not that new chartreuse soup that you want. <laughs> I know, that's, that's an evil color, isn't it, <laughs> for a soup? Yeah, but I just, I, no, right? Remember. He's, he's, he's growing us spiritually. 
He's giving us the things that we need spiritually to accomplish the things that he's given us to do, to keep his commands, right? Let's keep that. I always have to bring, if I, because if I let that go, somebody, somebody across the world is going to say, you see, you see, he said it, he said it. And they're going to start a whole new message on it. So keep listening. Verse 17, this command, uh, this I command you, that you love one another. There it is again. Commands again. Unbelievers, it must be important, right? To love one another, this must be important. Unbelievers, by their nature, do not practice godly righteousness. We as believers must love one another. As Christ displayed his perfect love for us in laying down his life for us. Another scripture here, 1 John. We're going to go into 1 John, chapter 3, verses 9. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verses 10 and 11. John chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So I underline that there because I wanted you to catch that. We're, 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 we're being told something here. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. So if you're, if you're a brother and sister in the Lord and you've got some brothers and sisters that you don't love, maybe you have some issue with them, and you, but you've know, you got a little ought with them, but you haven't gone to go clean that thing up, you, you need to do something about that. Otherwise, you're in jeopardy. Again, you know, it says, you know, for this message, which I have heard from the, from the, which you have heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. And then 12, not as Cain, woo, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So what does that tell you? That's another, that's a whole nother sin right there, right? It's, a, it's like envy, right? It's, it's, it's some evil stuff, but this, these are the kind of things that do happen within the church. A whole lot. More than we realize, more than we realize. We have to talk to one another, ladies and gentlemen. We have to be in communication with one another so we can pray for one another, know how to pray for one another so that we know if somebody's struggling with something. And at a certain point, you may have to confront somebody and say, look, you need to stop this. You know, there's that hard message again that you have to give to somebody that you love, who's a brother or sister in the Lord, that isn't acting right. Now, we can go into that and that teaching later on, but, the, but we're talking about something here where we're being reminded here by John. Verse 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. And we're not surprised, are we? It's becoming more and more evident every day. I don't know how many years it's been. I mean, it's, it was when our kids, our kids from our youth group, were, coming, were calling me from college, saying, you need to talk to my teacher. You need to talk to my, my professor. Dad, you need to talk to my daughter. And I remember <laughs> The middle one, she says, Dad, you've got to you gotta come talk to this guy. And you know, yeah, I'm not going to come talk to that guy. There's nothing else I'm going to say. He's just looking for me. <laughs> and I, I want to keep acting like a saved Christian. I don't want to have to, to be, have that, dis, that, that stress. No, no, no. But don't be surprised. In verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life. And that's one reason why we can take joy, right? Because we love the brethren. He does not love, uh, I'm sorry. He who does not love abides in death. I think that's a hard word there. Okay, let's go on to verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and, he, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And that's really what it's all about, right? 
Wow. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Okay, so all of you guys have got nice expensive guitars. That's everybody, right? Right? Oh. No. Okay. But that really kind of it kind of nails us so the little of us have good stuff. And someone has need, verse 18. Little children, and I like how it kind of brings it back to that loving parenting thing. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Right? Wow. We show our obedience and love for Christ when we show our love for one another. And that love is from a sincere heart. And let's finish up here. Hmm? I need, I need, I need, well, yeah. Mm. Let's, let's forget that guitar. We'll leave that at home. <laughs> let's finish here. First John chapter 4, 7 and 8. And you know this one. Because you know I like this one because this one, it's that song that we love. We should just sing it, but I won't. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. And I remember when I was a kid. The people used to always say, God is love. God is love. You know. And let's read verse 22 again. Because this is where we, start, where, we, where we got this. Which is 1 John chapter 1, verse 22. Ta- um, uh, yeah. 1 Peter. Yeah, I'm sorry. First Peter. Did I say 1 John? Yeah, 1 Peter. Yeah, I'm stuck on that 1 John. I want to I read that again. That's why. Verse 22, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for in sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Amen. And that's, that's the message. And then we'll go on. Next week we'll continue on and we'll go farther because we're going to be in, uh, we're going to go into um, uh, verse 20. We've got, no, we've got, we've got to go down to verse 25. So 23 is next and uh, we'll kind of, yeah, we're getting there. We're getting kind of close. But I'm pulling as much information out of these verses as I can because there's a lot to learn. And, and even tonight, we were, what we've been talking about, it's been, just, it's, it's been pretty amazing because it's caused me to have to, I have to read this and then I have to study it and I have to really get to understanding it. And then I have to really, it has to, see, you can't get out of it. You know, you can't, you, you know, it's, it's going to beat you up. You have to pick yourself up off the floor every now and then and get back at the computer. But God is good. And he's given us all that we need to be able to accomplish these things. We just need to be able to be willing to receive it and be obedient. Amen. Amen. That doesn't mean throw water on your sister or a brother or whoever. I'm talking to some folks in the back. Amen. <laughs> Father God, thank you, Lord.